Right, welcome to episode two of our hunting podcast called Dripwood. Now, just to re- remind viewers that Dripwood is a traditional African pot with three legs. And these three legs stand one in the USA, the other one in Pretoria, South Africa, and the other one in Perth, Australia. We are three Afrikaner hunters who love to just discuss uh, things around hunting And that is um, what we decided to call this uh, podcast of ours. It's called Dripwit. Um, It pronounces very difficult in English. That I can assure you. I've (laughs) I've tried my, uh, I'm a mathematics teacher here in Georgia and the kids are, it's almost impossible for Americans to pronounce that. But yeah, Dripwit is the hunting podcast in Pretoria, South Africa. Valentine, welcome Valentine. Hello, hello, everyone. And in Perth is Jan in his uh, gun shop. Uh, welcome, Jan. Thanks, Danny. Uh, Jan, just as by way of a little introduction, uh, tell us a little about uh, about uh, the Shooter Shed. Uh, Danny, yeah, the Shooter Shed is in a, about 20 minutes north of Perth. And we do uh, very general hunting equipment, uh, firearms, ammunition, uh, nice rifle bags, earring protection, stuff like that. Right. So uh, we no, we by no means uh, a Cabela's, but oh. <laughs> we aspire to it. <laughs> you aspire to be a best pro shop for Cabela's. <laughs> it, yes. it would be really nice to have such a shop. I think I would sleep there if I had one. Yes, 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 for sure. No, that is a fact. Valentine, um, if you can maybe also tell me a little bit about your hunting experience. Uh, where do you like to hunt? Where do you hunt these days and so on? Yeah, so um, as you introduced me, I'm from Pretoria, South Africa. So uh, mostly the closest part is the bush field where we um, started hunting from a young age. Um, yeah. yeah, so within an half an hour's drive, you can be in the bush field. But we try to hunt in all of the provinces. Um, each of those differ quite quite a lot, yeah. So it's but it's nice. Um, I do like the Eastern Cape as well. Uh, that's quite nice. Uh, the mountain ranges and the type of field you have there is quite nice. Okay. And then Old Faithful, yeah, up in the northern parts, um, the bush field. Okay, nice. I think uh, people who uh, listen to the podcast will realize that English is not our first language so at stages we we will just struggle to find the words and so on but yeah so we do our best in English but our mother tongue is Afrikaans all three of us young so what type of hunting in South Africa is your favorite? Danny I would have to agree with Valentine I I like the bushveld because it's walk and stalk yeah and I think that might it brings you back to the true meaning of what it means to hunt yeah. because it's uh, basically your skills against the animal without using uh, any other mechanical equipment than your rifle and what you can carry you no know, vehicles and stuff yeah um, a lot of uh, nice time spent in the Limpopo province up north in up to Messina and uh, down to Zambi, you know some hunts in the Free State and the Eastern Cape. So, but if I had to pick a place to go, it would be walking and stalking in the bush field. Yeah, That's absolutely. Now I will agree. So we will end this episode with some uh, discussion on walking and stalking. Uh, but for now, we will saddle up a very contentious issue. And that is that Jan is going to chat through the debate about 30 odd six uh, versus 308. Um, in the old days, Jan, can you remember our fathers fought over Ford versus Chev? I think in the old days, you know, pickups. Uh, this is as <laughs> divisive. But will, yeah. you, will you dance through the, the intricacies of those two calibers for us, please? Yeah, Danny, like with the, the discussion of the Ford versus Chev, uh, the main problem that we have when we talk about 306 and 308 is that we've got a group of storm supporters for each. Yes. And they, they got the full right to, to support the caliber that they're interested in. Yeah. Um, and the reason why there's never a win or a loss there is because they're both really, really good calibers. Yes. Um, if you uh, consider the 306 and uh, 308, uh, probably a good thing to 
let's look at the origin. The, around the uh, late 1800s, uh, the U.S. soldiers were issued with the city army or the city U.S. or the city 40 Craig Yogerson rifles, which fired a 30 cal projectile uh, using 40 grains of uh, propellant. And it drove that 220 grain round nose projectiles around 2,000 feet a second out of the 30 inch barrel. So they were quite happy with it until they got involved in the Spanish American conflict, the war in Cuba, and were on the receiving end of the 1893 Spanish Mausers uh, in 7 by 57. And it didn't take them long, like the British in South Africa, to realize that the 7x57 is ballistically far superior to what they were carrying. So um, the U.S. Ordnance Authority were looking around for ways to improve it, and they started uh, working on the loads and in increasing the velocity uh, to try and, and cope with the ballistics of the 7x57. But around 2,200 feet a second, uh, the, uh, the locking lugs on the bolts of the crack dragons and started to crack. So they abandoned that approach and approached Springfield. It was at that stage, sort of early 1900s, uh, busy with the 1903 Springfield rifle, which was reasonably successful, and asked them to see if they could do something to help. Uh, the guys at Springfield had a look at it and then later moved to a, a Mauser type action. Uh, the 3040 Craig had a, it was a rim cartridge, so it had a rim sticking out of the end of the case to help with extraction. So they moved to this, uh, similar to the 7x57 uh, rimless design with an extraction groove. And around 1906, after fiddling with what they called the 3003, um, Springfield was finally loading 150 grand spire point uh, 30 cal projectiles in what we today know as the, uh, the legendary 3006. Mm -hmm. uh, and it basically refers to a 30 caliber, uh, caliber projectile in a case that was uh, accepted around 1906. And there's also a little bit of a reference to Springfield who designed it. Now, that, uh, the 306 case uh, <coughs> had many children, uh, like the, well, based on the 306 design, the final. Uh, Calibers such as the 270, the, the 270 Winchester, the 35 Whelan, 20 Remington, 2006 uh, flow, has, has flown out of the 306 case. And about 45 years, uh, everybody was happy with the 306 until the US Ordnance Department again had a look at the 306 case and realized that there was a large unused volume in that case with the modern day powders and decided, you know, that's not very effective. We mm -hmm. need to find a way to make this, uh, to improve this and make it work better. So what they, uh, what they wanted to achieve was to save a bit of space so that uh, the soldiers could carry more ammunition. Um, and they started working on the, the 306 uh, with a project they called the T-65, uh, which was basically the four run up to the 762 by 51 Nauta. And they started out with the 300 Savage case, mm -hmm. uh, but soon realized there's not enough capacity. They will never get close to 306 performance out of that. And did the next best thing. They took a 306 case and cut it back about 12 millimeters. So, so reduced it by 19 to 20% in length and realized that with this compact cartridge they created, they can get 95% uh, of the velocity for 306 with lighter projectiles and 93% with heavier projectiles. So uh, they use min less materials and it make it uh, easier to carry larger amounts of ammo and uh, safe weight and, and uh, space, which was their uh, ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. So uh, Winchester had a look at this uh, attempt and saw the huge potential in it and uh, in 1952, released to the public what is known today as the 308 Winchester. And uh, in 1954, the 762 Naro was accepted, which is almost identical to the 308, but it can't be loaded to the pressures of the 308. So they're very similar. Mm -hmm. But uh, the 308 was basically a forerunner to the, the, the 762 Naro. 
And from the 308 again, there's a number of really good calibers that uh, has developed using that case as a base, such as the 243, the 708, 260 Remington, 358 Winchester, and some others by A Square and Sabi and uh, people who like to use existing cases to make new calibers. Uh, if we consider the 306 and the 308, and we consider, you know, what is common to them, if you take a packet of uh, projectiles per shelf to load a 308 or a 306 case, it's exactly the same projectile. So you can put exactly the same projectile on a 308 or a 306 case. Uh, you'll get a, a, a wide variety of uh, ammunition for different applications in both the calibers. <clears throat> and um, in some countries around the world, the popularity is basically driven by what's available army surplus-wise ammunition. But some countries have military surplus ammunition in, in both of these calibers. So it really doesn't matter. 306 is, you know, between 150 and 150 feet a second faster. Uh, deliver uh, projectiles a bit faster than the 308 and 306s. So um, what you can do with the 306, you can download it to simulate the 308, which you can't do with the 308. But you basically gain a flatter trajectory. And uh, the sacrifice you need to make is to contend with the little bit of extra recoil you get yeah. uh, from gaining that velocity. <clears throat> and if we talk about recoil and you think back to Newton's three laws of motion, you know, if you have two identical firearms, each one of each of the calibers weighing the same thing, pushing the same projectile through the same length of barrel at the same velocity. And you use that bits of information, you, you stick it uh, into the equations. I think everybody will agree that the recoil would be identical. So it's just contending with what you gain, you know, the, the velocity that you gain, uh, handling a bit more recoil. And recoil can be tamed using multiple brakes and uh, where it's legal, you can use uh, suppressors. Uh, which re also reduce the noise component, make it easier to handle. So um, in short, then the, the 308, you can get 95% uh, of the velocity with, with lighter projectiles that you get from a 306 and 93% with, uh, with heavier uh, projectiles. And now there's uh, people that will argue that but the 308 is inherently a more accurate caliber than a 306, but um, it probably has to do with the fact that there was so much development work done on 308 because it's so popular for target shooting and tactical work. Uh, the um, modern manufacturing tools and, uh, you know, the, the, specifically the reamers that's available in both 306 and 308 these days, which weren't available earlier in 306, I think, will bring a 306 very close to what you can get out of a 308. And if you put the right tools in the right hands, mm -hmm. you'll get a nice, very nice long range rifle in 306 as a result. Um, there are some classes in some of the matches that will be caliber, caliber specific. So you can't shoot it with anything else than say 308, like the, in Palma, uh, the Palma class uh, target shooting, you can't use another caliber. So uh, in that case, you have to have a 308. But um, if you're shooting near the, the edge of what the calibers are designed for, Mm. You will definitely have a little bit of an advantage from the uh, 306. You'll have to add a few more clicks of uh, elevation to a 308 to get to the same point. And the wind will probably have a slightly more uh, of an influence on your path towards the target because of the uh, 308 being a little bit slower than the 306. So there's a, a bit more time where the wind can influence the, the trajectory of the projectile. But I mean, if you look at it as a pure hunting rifle and you consider the envelope in which we operate in normal hunting environment, which is, uh, let's say 300 meters, 330, 350 yards. You know, if you don't shoot every day at large animals, uh, the little bit of energy that you gain from the 306 would definitely not make a big difference. 
and uh, what you gain from the 308 is that will be like it will be a little bit uh, lighter if you build it in a light rifle because the action will be a little bit shorter and you can carry a little bit more ammunition and uh, if you're in a position to buy a 308 and a 306 uh, think about the rest of us who can't and enjoy uh, being able to shoot both of them because they're both great calibers. Excellent. You sound like a, a, a gun shop owner promoting people to buy both. Both, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could. Around here, we have a problem, you know, owning uh, one of each. So the guys have to make a decision which one they, they want. Really, really. And okay. uh, yeah, uh, with you in America, you know, you can walk into a shop and buy a 306 and a 308 and walk out. Around here, yeah. it's a whole lot of explaining to do, you know, if you want <laughs> to try and one of each. I see. Okay. Yeah, I can maybe add two things. Um, just where I stand, so I shoot the three out six. Um, I quite like it. Um, but um, as Jan explained, there's one there's there's one advantage though when you shoot the three out eight instead of the three out six um, regarding reloading, and that's the amount of propellant you use within it. So a bottle of propellant will last you a little bit longer. Um, mm -hmm. which is maybe a good thing or not. Um, yeah. And regarding suppressors, um, we do get them here. Yeah, for those uh, of the guys that don't know, we can buy them. It's um, available in all shops. And most of the hunting farms these days in South Africa actually prefer guys shooting with suppressors yes. um, just to um, help with this, yeah. the noise levels um, and the animals to be just a little bit more relaxed. So, yeah. so most of the hunters these days do have suppressors in, in yeah. South Africa. Yes. So the recoil is... So Donnie, maybe, 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 sorry, yes, Jan? No, no, finish that discussion first. And no, um, it's I just, just the, to... the recoil thing was for me when I came to America and I wanted to buy some, uh, you know, a gun and I have a 14-year-old son. I was, mm. would love to have a 30 odd six, but the recoil is an issue. And the fact that suppressors mm. are not really uh, available over here. Jan? Yeah. Uh, Danny, just the final thing I wanted to mention uh, that sort of slipped my mind a little bit is that we need to remember that the 306 is at least 45 years older than the 308. Now, older could probably inspire, well, we could probably choose a better word and call it classic. And it okay. seems to me that, that especially if you look at older guns, that was built sort of around the 1960s, 1970s, that the style that a 306 length action display, it just puts you slightly in another class. You know, you don't get the same feeling uh, looking at a shorter action 308 most of the time. I think maybe because they're a bit more modern. But if you into uh, something that uh, has more of a classic design, uh, like the beautiful pre-64 Winchester Model 70s, and especially mm -hmm. the English designed rifles with the longer actions, with the Mulder type actions as well. Um, it might be that, you know, the looks will convince yeah. you that the 306 is the way to go. Yes. If you're more practical and you just want the really light rifle, the light as light as possible, because if you're going up in the hills, then the, 30, uh, the 308 will definitely uh, have certain advantages that you need to consider. Absolutely. Yeah. No, for sure. Uh, you know, you, you cannot wrestle or quarrel about looks and choose for people. But what you say about just a classic look of a, a 30 odd six is definitely an issue. Valentin, um, can we move over across to reloading a little bit? Talk to us a little bit uh, about uh, case preparation. Yes, uh, thanks, Donnie. So as you can see, I'm here in my reloading room, my man cave. Um, so we're talking about a bit today about um, like prep casing your, or, or prepping your cases. Um, but I'll, I'll try to go it in nine short steps, um, just to just to basically the things you must look out for. Um, sure. I think we must start off with the brass. Um, so when you buy brass, I think point number one is uh, when you start reloading and prepping cases, buy the best brass that you can possibly afford um uh, that's i think that's um number one 
Regarding the second step, um, when you size a bunch of cases, there's, a, there's, there's a, a variety of things you can do. You can full size, you can next size, and then you can do it in a in two full size in two steps as well. So just to show you guys that as well, um, this is a, a, a foster um, next sizing dice. So it, 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 I do next size, but after a few, a, a few next sizing attempts, um, Usually you, you'll start to feel it when your um, weapon doesn't function that good anymore. So then you need to use something like a body die just to bump that one thou or two thou back again, just so that it, it um, loads the, uh, quite nicely within your weapon. So it is more accurate. There's a lot of things I'll just go to them now, but just regarding the sizing, there's a lot of options as well. So you can do that, but we'll talk about sizing your brass next time. One thing about um, the brass preparation is what, which is quite important I think is to trim all your cases to the same length. You can you can use a lot of there's a lot of tools something as um, as, as old-fashioned as, as this little one works quite well you get a way uh, a, a, a quite a variety of new nice tools that you can can use um, but that's quite important to trim all of your cases. To the same overall length. Um, then chamfering your brass is quite important as well. You get you get a you you can either do hand the hand tools so you can do just to chamfer them at the end um, after sizing. There's a there's a few tools that you can use, or you can buy yourself a nice um, electronic one like like this turntables, which saves you a lot of time. Um, then one thing about about working with your brass, the, the main game is to to try to get the, um, your brass as um, the concentricity as good as possible. So um, the, the next thing you can do to just to make sure that all of them are exactly the same is to turn the neck cases um, so it, so that you can actually um, release the tension uh, and be sure that the bullet concentricity is um, is a little bit better regarding your brass. Um, another thing that's quite important regarding brass is um, using your your uniforming tool, so your your flash hole uniformer tool, uh, which goes in the inside, and that cuts out the flash hole from the inside to be able to to ensure that they are cut uniformly. And then a big thing as well is just to make sure that your primer pockets are uh, are cut with a with a uniforming tool. As I say, you get hand tools, uh, or you get one that's electronic um, that's on a, a turntable like that one. But be sure that you do both of those. Um, that's quite important. Um, then. Uh, Check for the concentricity. Like I said, we would like to um, ensure that all our brass are exactly the same. And I think one thing that just to end off with um, is to be able to, when you start classifying your brass, is uh, if you are a, are a reloader that's only starting off or you are a bit more experienced, start classifying or, or, or weighing all of your brass and, and just um, bunch of those, just bunch them together within um, a point one of a grain together. So I, I put all of my brass in different color cases. All of my green ones are ammo because um, if they are in my safe and um, sometimes you grab the wrong one and then you grab a bunch of um, cases to go hunt with, that's not a good thing. So I just, I, I just buy two different colors and I group those um, brass in 50, um, 50 bunches of 50 together. I weigh all of them. I make sure they within the range, uh, within a 0.1 grain range, so that basically at the end of the day, that the water volume of all of those are exactly the same. So okay. if we get the, the volume exactly the same and the neck tension is exactly the same, then we can ensure that all of our brass preparation um, is as good as possible, then we'll know that we've done everything possible to be able to see the good results on the paper at the end of the day when we shoot. When we shoot. So that's a, that's a short thing uh, just around about of regarding brass. Excellent. John, would you like to add something there? Yes. 
uh, Valentin, yeah, I think it's a really good idea. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, Odette's lather test, but if you make sure that you get the outsides of the cases as uh, uniform as possible, then you can reasonably assume that if they weigh the same, that the inside volumes are reasonably close. And I think, you know, that's one of the prerequisites to make a lather test work. If you don't uniform the cases, um, there might be differences in volumes that can give you false information if you do that test. So I think it's a really good thing to do. And I think it's really good to, to keep these cases apart. Uh, sometimes what happens, you know, if you get uh, some of your cases mixed up, you have to weigh them again to get them sorted. But I think it's worth it to, to keep those together because, as you said, you know, in the end, what all that you need to know is that you did everything you could to make it as good as possible, and then you have to deal with the results. But at least if you look at the results, you can feel reasonably comfortable that there's not much more that can be done yeah. and that you need to look to another place to solve the, the issue if there's an issue. And I think that type of uh, method makes it a lot easier to move forward with your loads. Good. Yeah, just uh, just to finish off, Jan, um, I mark all of my my loads uh, with a certain color. So if, if it falls out, then it's just easily sorted. So yeah. it's important just to keep those same batches together. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, uh, just to maybe mention, I have to do here with a mathematician and a mechanical engineer. So <laughs> you can hear the mathematical precision with which you go forward, but that is excellent and it will ensure good results on paper, like you say, Valentine. Thank you very much for that. Okay, thank you so much, Valentine, for the, uh, for the discussion on reloading. Uh, so, as Jan mentioned in the beginning, uh, I think the beauty of hunting in Africa is often the walking and stalking. And I think it's, a, it's something that American hunters would love to do. And we will just go through a little bit of the, the steps we take in walking and stalking. We have, the, we have the luxury to learn from people in the field. So often when you go to the bush felt and you hunt, there might be a tracker that goes with you. Now, this guy has either been on the farm for 30 years, so he knows it inside out. Secondly, he's done it for 30 years, so he knows how to walk and stalk properly, and you learn from him. Other times, you have ex-military people that know how to track properly, and you learn from them. And so it ends up being such a good learning experience. So the first thing that I have learned in the hard way, because my son and I go hunt on our little farm on the, on the banks of the Limpopo River, but just by ourselves, is the wind okay so it, it feels like it's a normal thing to do and in america you sit in a in a stand and you cannot do much about the wind so you do nothing you know you don't, you don't take it into consideration but in i've hunted and walked 10 to 15 miles on a weekend not seeing anything because i didn't take into consideration hunting upwind so that is the first very important thing that um, to take into consideration. It is not just a mere suggestion. You will, yeah. you will hunt for 10, 15 miles on a weekend and see nothing if you don't take the wind into consideration. Then the second thing is that um, what we've often learned to do is, you know, you're excited when you see game the first time and they see you and they take off and they run a little bit and you, you want to almost pursue them. And the chances are almost zero of any success if you pursue them immediately. So we got into the habit of just kneeling down and sitting there and sitting almost longer than what you think you should. For them to run off a little bit, they will, they will look back and see if you're pursuing them and then they will start relaxing again. And then you have a possible chance of maybe at a slightly different angle to approach them again and find them then rest, resting and feeding again. But so we made mistakes often to you know, to just go after them. They will not let you catch them. So that's the thing. As far as tracks go, um, we've learned to, to read between fresh tracks and old tracks. Now, the fresh ones are nice and crisp on the edges. They have no sand that have fallen into the tracks. So then you will know you, you may be at close range to some animals coming up. Also some droppings, you know, we, we got into the habit of, you know, just putting the back of your hand onto the droppings to feel if they're nice and warm. And, you know, if they are, then you know uh, you're, you're approaching animals.
results and you should take great care. Um, so uh, let me see what else do we have. Yeah, so if you, um, if you pursue animals, uh, and I've been with good trackers sometimes, you will see that that antelope uh, we once went behind after a gemstok, uh, uh, oryx. And you can see in the tracks that he is looking backwards. Now, that is, you know, a, a big skill. So <laughs> we just gave up on it because we could see that that thing is walking, that oryx is walking in front of us. But every so often you can see in the tracks, he's, he's looking this way and looking this way. And you just knew he knows you're back behind him. Give up, search for something else. So, you know, it's maybe something to do is, is, is give up sometimes and look for for different op options. Um, one thing I learned from a, a professional hunter in, uh, in, the, in the Freiburg area, uh, and he was also a professional hunter in Kruger, is that he told me, we spoke last week about the, uh, the spiral horn uh, and antelope. Now, sometimes you're looking for a male animal and, 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 and a trophy and so on. So he showed me specifically how you can see that the, specifically in the uh, spiral horn, um, antelope that their chests are wide and so the male animals the, the male animals their chests are wider than the females and so the tracks you can see that the that the front feet are wider than the back feet and it's only in the spiral horn um, antelope that you see that difference in width between the females and the males so so we've learned to specifically I mean if we are looking for a male animal to distinguish that width um, uh, between the males and the females so um, but it's just amazing I don't know if you guys have experience but the, some of these trackers are so good at I mean they can almost put a minute to that track you know they, they would stop and say you know this this impala is three minutes this way you know by looking at it but that, that crispness of the of the uh, of the track is definitely something that I've learned uh, over the years I don't know uh, Jan can you add some stuff there Dani, yeah, I think it's really important to be able to to track. In some cases, you know, you might have really hard ground or rocks to contend with, and the, the spur would disappear. And what a lot of these trackers do is they would send someone around to see if they can pick up the track ahead of them, or where the animal has come off the hard patches, yes. and then immediately give up on that and and catch up. You know, so they. Yes. They work in teams sometimes, which is probably something worth mentioning. Absolutely. Also, when you when you've wounded, the blood spur almost stops sometime, yeah. and then yeah, you don't want to all rush ahead because you might lose this yeah. spot. So someone yeah. else goes ahead, you know. So that's excellent. Valentine, add something. Yeah, I'm I'm astonished with how good some of these trackers are. Especially, it's it's quite easily if you can learn quite fast to be able to track them when it's when it's nice and ground where you can actually see the spur quite well. But yeah, the moment when there's a lot of grass, for instance, then it's a whole nother level of tracking. Then it's quite difficult if you if you don't have a trained eye, and they'll yes. they'll beat you with those trained eyes of theirs um, time and time again. So I think yes. that's um, one thing to mention is also um, it's it's definitely the more you do it, the better you get at it. So uh, yeah. about tracking. So uh, in, even when seeing, when driving through through the bush, just say, say for instance, on a vehicle, just to be able to quickly spot these animals is quite a skill as well. And you, you get better at it the more you do it. Um, yes. so, so if you get in the bush for the first time and, the, these guys beat you each time just to see the animals. It's fine. <laughs> You'll yes. pick up as you go ahead. Uh, so, but they are quite, quite good. Yeah. The, the, the one thing that they also are good at is to distinguish the color of just the regular vegetation versus the color of an impala or something. It is mm -hmm. just uh, amazing how they will know this is not a red bush. This is an impala. Or oh, no, 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 relax. That is not an impala. Yeah. It is a red bush, you know. Yeah. So um, uh, one thing that I've learned from you, Valentine, is also even after the shot to not pursue quickly. You know, um, mm -hmm. you want to go and find your, your trophy and be happy about it, but it's, it's never a good idea. But also here in America, we've seen that it's not a good enough. Uh, idea to pursue immediately yeah it, it, take your time it's especially after a shot as well as you mentioned now um to take your time is always a good thing um 
when when walking and stalking especially as well is to take your time walk a little bit um sometimes within the bushfield here uh, um you you can sometimes see better when you're a bit lower as well yes so it's it's two things walk slowly look around and make sure that especially when you get into a new opening or something yeah make sure that you just don't walk into the opening because the chances are that there's a lot of impala just behind that opening and they see you like yeah like daylight yeah so yes, yes slow yes. slow and steady get you there yeah yeah, you know, I think it's really important, you know, that the, the size of the and the composition of the area that you hunt in sometimes dictate, you know, whether it's a good place to walk and stop or not. And I think a lot of places where you have to sit in, in hides and tree stands and stuff is just because uh, you, you can't navigate the bush, you know, there's uh, like Swartak or something like that, that uh, is very thorny and you can't move through it. Or it's smaller patches where there's just not enough room to move around on your feet. You have to sit and wait for the animals to come past you because they moved through three or four different areas which you can't access. Yeah. And uh, I think that's quite an important thing. And uh, you mentioned bending down and have a look. I've seen a lot of uh, <laughs> success with bending down because it's sometimes easier to, to, to see just the legs of the animal because they're sometimes a different color from the rest of the animal and you yeah. pick that up quite easily. Yes. Look, bending down is definitely, I remember vividly we shot one impala by doing that specifically, but now I, I have the luxury of a son who wrestles and he has a good strength, what would you say, weight to power ratio and he climbs trees again now at least four or five times we've i've picked him up and sent him up a tree and he gets the just the height above those tree tops and uh then he he sees the antelope and then you can make a plan get the wind right mm -hmm. and and pursue in that way so we've really astonished some experienced trackers by sending him up a tree and then we have success. Um, we've, we've shot quite a few. We have two dead uh, trees down at the bottom of our uh, farm and we always walk up to them and he gets up in those and most of the, and then you are so surprised that you've missed an impala by 50 yards. You know, you've walked right past them. You get down there, he gets up in the tree and he sends you back this way. So he often sits in the tree and then he, he I just look back at him and then he goes this way or that way or so. And we've, we've had good success there, but you need a power to weight ratio. <laughs> I don't know. I could never get into those trees. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that is why, you know, so low down, but also high up get you some mm. some good um some good success a different perspective yep yes yes okay guys this was a wonderful discussion 308 30 odd six case preparations thank you so much guys and we will talk again next time jan hopefully it's wonderful to be in your shop there in perth thank you very much for today thanks danny have a good week yes thank you so much valentine thank you for being there in your man cave and we'll do that again next time Thanks. Nice speaking to you today. Yes. Excellent.